relationships, but you're wrong. Listen, there's no magic bullet. I'm teaching life skills. Yeah. When you sick, you need medicine. It don't always taste good. Oh, nah. But it'll get you better. You, you, you need this medicine. Yeah. It ain't gonna always taste good. But this is what you need. Men and women, bottom line, we need to have the conversation. Your partner wants to give up control, but only if you know how to drive. This is about being the best you you could ever be, whoever you are. I don't care if you're a man, a woman, LGBTQ, space alien. I'll save anybody. I don't care. I'll teach a hedgehog how to have a threesome. What do you mean by that? Look, you don't have to listen to me, but you're wrong. Listen, I know I'm great. And I know you're thinking, Dante, there's no way I could be like you. But you could be me, you know why? Because you know who I was before I was me? I was you. you. Man school, 202. Better hear what I've got to say because you won't get it again. I'm not an alpha male. I'm not a beta male either. I'm just a better man. Better man. Well, put your happiness first, because if you don't, they won't. Yo, 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 yo. What up, GYBB? Get your, go- get your balls back. WWDD, what would Dante do? The sexual revolution is being podcasted, and I am excited. We got a special guest. Now, I know I've said that a thousand times before, but this time I really mean it. Harry, what's up? You ready to rock and roll? Hey, you know damn well I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm ready to, I'm ready to kick it with all the fly ladies and fellas. Is that what kids <laughs> I, are saying nowadays? I, I don't rock know. Out, keep I'm on probably, trucking? I'm almost sure they're not saying keep on trucking, but okay. anyway. Shout out to Andre. Andre's, back. Andre's out in LA doing his thing, doing big things, hoping to trying to get us a career. Um, so we're, we're setting him out as a, as a scout to get a career with us. So shout out to Andre in the building. Uh, we got a special guest in the building. Uh, this young lady, I uh, love her to death. Um, she's really hustling around. We're going to talk about that. Talk about uh, 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 love on a, in a tiny house and all kinds of stuff. Uh, give it up for D Burnett, y'all. Give it up for D Burnett. What's up, sweetie? Thanks for having me, Dante. Excited to be here. Thanks for doing it. I really appreciate it. It's dope. It's dope. So, wait, we got to get into this first. Because right? okay. this is... This I've is only like, heard about this tiny house thing on, you know, like on the internet. And sometimes people will go out of their way to buy a tiny house. Is this the case to save money? Or what? what's going on, D? Explain this tiny house so, situation. I mean, it goes that like around 15 years ago, I started, I was living in a studio apartment with my daughter in LA Mm -hmm. and it was just, I was like, and the neighbors were loud and it was just irritating. And I stumbled upon the concept of a tiny house. Mm -hmm. Uh, People were doing container houses and just tiny living. And I was, it was a freak occurrence that I stumbled upon it while looking for like configurations for a studio apartment. And uh, and it was just one of the it was just one of those things at the time that we needed to move into one like that. Right. Um, and how I was old, working how at the old, How old was your daughter at that time? She was sixteen. Okay. So it was just so almost a la- 16. so a lady. She was, she was almost yeah. a lady, right? Yeah, she was fifteen, and we were both at the time working at the Hollywood Improv. I was okay. managing, and she was the box office girl. Okay. Dope. And then we wound up in this situation where we needed to move into the studio apartment and it was it was what it was. Um but we were looking for configurations and I was like, oh look at this. There's these tiny houses. Right. And I thought, how cute. Right. And I was like, look, they have no neighbors. These people live in the woods in a mm. field. Right, you know, right. This is amazing. <laughs> you know, like right. park anywhere. They just drive their house around when they have to move. And I thought, what a fabulous concept. Um, now, was this, were you looking at kind of the tiny houses that you hook up to a, a, a like a pickup truck and roll it? Or were you talking about initially? A, a, yeah. I also see an encapsulated where they actually like it's almost like an RV, but it's a, you know, convert like I've seen one on a school bus and stuff like that. So what I have now is a school bus. We took oh. a 37 foot flat nose school bus and converted it into a tiny home. Um mm. But looking at it back then, okay. I just liked the thought of being in an air, you know, just being mobile. 
Uh-huh. I spent years on the road. Um, I traveled all the time. There was always some relative consideration to shit. I may have to move in six months because work's going to take me here or there, or I'm paying, you know, $1,500 a month to live in a studio apartment in LA. And mm. I'm there for, you know, <laughs> it's housing my crap right. Like, <laughs> right, right. and I'm not even using it on the road. So it was just like, a, it was just kind of a thing that I've always toyed around with. And then, uh, after my husband and I got married last October, we had really through the whole pandemic and shutdown talked about how great that would be for the mobility's sake, right, like right. being able to just go take a job somewhere for four months because mm-hmm. that's what it was or, uh-huh. you know, whatever, just being mobile. Now, is it difficult to, to find the parking or like to find a place to park or can you pretty much park anywhere you want to park? I mean, I, it's difficult in LA. Like, you know, I, I don't think you'd really want to do that in a city unless you really have it mapped out, but uh-huh. we're self-contained. We have uh-huh. solar, we do wow. compostable in the restroom, wow. and then we have a hundred gallon watt fresh water tank with filtration. Now, where do you, you just hook up to a hydrant and get the water or how does that work? I mean, you can go to filling stations okay. and fill, but uh, we could also be pump, you know, parked by a lake and throw a hose in and pump in. Oh, and it filters because you got a filter. Wow. Yep. That's wow. so this So this depending must on be where it is. Really that, cheap now. And you're this is completely, a of- completely mobile, you're saying. Completely mobile. Completely mobile and and completely self-sustaining. So we don't we could go park in. We're we're currently in the middle of the desert. Uh-huh. And we are fortunate enough because we wanted to make a few changes to the bus. I had originally put in like a convection oven and did an induction burner. We had a lot of electric stuff running. Right, right. Um, I was really, I, I was first, at first, really funky about propane. I just thought, I was like, I don't want a propane stove that I feel like you're worried it's going to blow up. Worry. Right. Right. Um, but the more that we've been on the bus and I've used propane for other things, mm-hmm. I'm less afraid. Okay. And now I'm like, no, I want that propane range. I want to be able to cook cook gas because i cook right, and i right, bake right. and so i'm like nope i want to be able to i want a full kitchen so uh, is your daughter still of, with you or, or oh no my daughter is almost 30 she works okay. at netflix okay <laughs> dope, 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 dope. <laughs> um oh so how long yeah, did but, the, how long was the transition between when she was 15 and you actually doing the bus and did you what 15 was years <laughs> when i mean we had to finish the bus Oh, we just started that in February and uh, moved into it in April Uh and then uh, decided to make modifications to allow us to go fully off grid like the solar, which my husband is actually picking up and installing today, which is why um, I'm I'm dialing in from a beautiful hotel in hotel using that term loosely Uh in Barstow. (laughs) <laughs> okay. All right. So the um and what about internet and stuff like that? Do you have a, a disc on top or what? So currently T Mobile offers a really good yeah. mobile solution. Yeah, yeah. And that's worked so far. But we mm-hmm. haven't been to places that don't have internet um reasonable access or really good service through T Mobile. Okay. Okay. Now the the since you started doing the solar now right because it's it's weird because init- I remember initially you know the solar panels were really kind of bulky and they weren't really efficient and now they have things are so much better now you know mm-hmm. so yeah. now we'll wind up with um, and with what we will have on the rooftop of the bus because it's a thirty seven foot school bus right so what we'll have and that gives us about. 210 square feet of living space inside. Wow. Okay. Um, we've got underneath storage and we've built a platform on the back for, you know, where we house like the jet where we can load, you know, we'll, we'll carry the barbecue grill. We'll carry our outside stuff. So it's basically like our garage is on wow. the back oh, on a platform. So, oh, that's so and dope. I kept my car. Mm. Oh, so you do. I you... kept a. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> you can't so commute dope. in places and drive without it. Yeah, yeah. That's so dope. Because, I mean, how long have how, you been in comedy for a long time? How long have you been in, involved in comedy? Well, I, I opened the San Jose Improv in 2000. Okay, so like 20. And I worked with the Improv Comedy Clubs for 13 years. Mm -hmm. um, I worked for briefly for a ticketing company that was established in 2009. And then um, I left in 2000, almost 2013, when they were acquired by a different company. And you, didn't you work the Ice House for a while or no? I was the last booker at the Ice House before the, the shutdown. Oh, wow. Um, so I was booking there. I booked John Lovett's Comedy Club for the last year that it was open. Uh -huh. I've produced shows off and on. I was Ralphie Mays tour manager right. back so you, in 2006. You, deep, you up to your neck in this. In this. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, so dope. That was, yeah. And was being that. in the mm -hmm. comedy business that long is what drives you to living in a tiny house. <laughs> you know, honestly, a big motivator was being able to be on the road, produce shows independently and literally be on the road. That's awesome. Wow. It really is awesome to be able to I like mean, just take off and go anywhere. Yeah. Well, so you know, my entire comedy career, my doors have always been open to comics. I used to do Sunday suppers every Sunday, whether I was living in a crappy little studio apartment or a big house. Right, right. Just I would do Sunday comics supper come and just oh, tell them, come eat. Yeah, that's, that's every really amazing. Thanksgiving, that's really you know? awesome. I ain't going to lie, D. I mean, we, we haven't, you know, hung out uh, and stuff like that. But uh, comics have such a great when you name you, your name comes up. There's such a great, you know, loving kind of uh admiration for you and just in general just you know especially in a business where there's so many shitty people you know a lot yeah. lots of shitty that adoration is mutual though because I feel like it's the most underrated underappreciated difficult art form on the planet yeah. and I'm a purist when it comes to to stand up you know yeah. When they say I do, I do a little sketch, or I want to be an actor. Well, go do those things, but don't discredit that stand up yeah. is its own uh, thing. I love you. You're, you're a woman after my heart because yeah. it's just <laughs> it's so disrespectful. Who's your Who's your your name? Your three all time favorites. Um. Well, I was exposed to stand up very very small, so I'd have to say uh, from being very tiny, Red Fox and Steve Martin. Really? Wow. wow. Two nice. very different acts. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, getting a little older, I, I, I listened to everything George Carlin did, Lenny Bruce. Uh -huh. um, uh, you are a purist, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, my fa my fave, I, I would just absorb stand up in any way that I could. I had yeah. a fake ID at 15, yeah. not to go out and drink, but just to get into the comedy club. Now, what, what made you so, I mean, what brought you, like, what was the thing that, just that you loved about it. I mean, you know, I, I think there was always just such a everybody in my family has always had a just a crazy good sense of humor about everything. Right. Uh, and we were raised that if if, you know, you weren't being picked on and if everybody wasn't talking, they shit, don't like you. Was, yeah, they don't we like, probably yeah. don't like you, you yeah, know, so yeah. And um, my dad was wonderfully, wonderfully funny all the time. And he was a musician. And just always exposed us to stand up from very young. Yeah. He was like, it, this is funny. He goes, can you imagine somebody just like being funny with their words all the time? And that's their job. Yeah. Wow. Just such a, yeah. So that it, comes it's from, funny because it I used to you say that because I said, uh, I used to say like, you know, Patrice, you know, he could cut like a, <laughs> like a night. And I would, and I used to always say people, I was like, if if he don't if he's not making fun of you he don't like you because if he don't like you he don't talk to you he, he hey what's up and he just keeps it moving but he if only way he liked you is if he if he messed with you you know I didn't and I didn't get that at first because I was so used to comics and I was young I was in my twenties when I started in two thousand right right you know so when I was on the road with Ralphie May two thousand six yeah. of course one of the people that I was exposed to the most. He was doing a lot of the bigger festival types, like the Opie and Anthony yeah, yeah, yeah. festival, yeah. like yeah, he was all of the bigger stuff virus. that he was yeah, doing. Ralphie virus. was on also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
so, you know, that was like that. I feel like I was on the road with them for six months with that. Yeah. Because yeah. everywhere, every big show that Ralphie had like that, Patrice was on also. Yeah. And of course, you know, I was a tour manager. So I was by the, I was in the green room listening, a fly on the wall. Oh, God. In some of the most magical circumstances to be around comedy, in my opinion. I feel very blessed that yeah. I was able to be a part of that. People don't even understand that. Like, you know, and look, I mean, you know, you're talking about, you know, the be like I, I started in 2000. So, you know, I, it was a whole like it was like I like that whole tough crowd crew. And even, you know, Ralph used to come yeah. in. And but those guys, I don't I, I think that was such a golden age of comedy because of the fact that even though they didn't realize that they were pushing each other, they were pushing each other artistically because it was so vastly different, but very so, so, so very distinct, but so very good in the same sense. Greg Giraldo and Patrice and Norton, and you watch these guys, and I really got to watch these guys at a very young age and kind of um, uh, and, and grow up under that, what you talk about, those kind of magical moments. Oh, 100%. I think one of the more underrated comics that came out of that time is Jim Florentine. He's Whoa. bar none one of my favorites. Really? And I love, like, I love what he does. And I feel like he was, he was in that, in that generation of comics. Well, too. you know, Jim, Jim came from a lot of the, he, he was the best of the, the <laughs> Long Island hacks yeah. do you know what i mean like he was yeah. the so it's kind of like like tony rock was like a like a chitlin circuit comment but he was <laughs> heads above yeah like he was so much better than those guys that it translated across but i i, I even remember when he started doing comedy as jam and jim uh, uh yeah jam <laughs> when he was jam and jim he was jam you and jim. have you ever seen that headshot where he's got like the white snake hair. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my god, it's oh, phenomenal. Are you me? <laughs> it and Jim, is phenomenal. Jim was Jim was here's when I really uh, kind of fell in love with Jim. You Jim when Jim roast, woof. Oh. oh he's so oh he's so mean and so that's it's like, so beautiful. <laughs> that's oh, delicious. Yeah, when, yeah, when he <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God! It's people now. Here's a funny thing that I find this in. Uh, um, do you do you know you know Candy? Candy Which, Claire. Candy Claire. She was working with New York Comedy Club, and then she just moved out to LA and and stuff. I don't know. If you know. I have not had a chance to work with her. Uh huh. But the name. Okay. Like the so, reputation proceeds. So here's her. the thing. So so the thing is that Candy Candy works. She worked stand up a lot, right? And she was hanging out with us, right? So here's yeah. here's the big question: You hang out with these guys, maybe some of the most, the funniest and the most, the smartest and the the most creative people you ever like. Just right. how do you get? Because her biggest problem is how does she? She can't. She has such a problem dating squares because. She compares the, you know what I'm saying? When you talk about those magical moments, oh. like how do you bridge that? Well, you know, I, it, I got married last October. Okay. Um, and my husband, I've known him since high school. Okay. He lived in Washington for the last, you know, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Worked on, uh, worked in a, at a paper mill okay. in Washington. Was a union paper mill worker. 20 years. So a regular dude, but just a, a good dude. Just a so fucking regular. It's obnoxious. <laughs> you don't <laughs> get more regular than he is. Um, but his sense of humor, his own sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And he had never been to a, co a live comedy show before really? I took him. Wow. How long ago? How long ago did you take him? This uh, first one. He, when, I, when we first started going out, you know, because we kept in touch for years and years mm -hmm. remotely. Just we were friends in high, you know, we right, knew right, each right. other in high school. And we just kind of kept in touch through social media, whatever. And um, circumstances just allowed us to connect in 2018 in person. Had zero expectation of anything romantic happening. He was mm -hmm. just coming down for a vacation from Washington. Mm -hmm. Right. 
And um, as you I often do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I took a bit, you know, I, live, I was living in Long Beach and it was not uncommon for friends from out of the area. That's happened to me for the last 20 years in L.A. Yeah. If I was living in L.A., hey, I'm finally going to make it to L.A. Can, can, I I come, can, with you? can I come and show? Can I, can I, yeah. can I come to a show? Mm -hmm. And I happen to be working with the rec room in Huntington Beach. Okay. Great club. Loved that club. So I was yeah. working with a rec room and Dan Cummings was the comic okay. that week that weekend that he came okay. down. And so his very first live comedy experience uh -huh. was Dan Cummings. Okay. And just in conversation, we would always make Marty and I would always just make each other laugh. We could right, laugh right. at anything. Right, right. Which is which is important anyway, but um what he laughed at during the show. You were like, okay, oh, this guy. I had heart, like, it was like little hearts and birds, <laughs> you know? I was like that. And I love that he's not in the industry. Right. He right. has respect for it. He doesn't understand it. Um, when you say he, he doesn't understand it, what do you mean? Because there's times that he just doesn't understand. He's like, I get it, but it's just so far from normal. Like, me, meaning like, like I don't I'm, I'm I mean I I mean you know I mean I've been doing it twenty so it's hard for me to even perceive normality. Well, he doesn't understand like during a show if you have a set time, why would you ever be late to that if that's your job? <laughs> okay, yeah, oh, that's yeah, a, you well, like, that's a union you know guy. I mean? like, there's that's a union that kind of... paper mill dude. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's yeah. just little things where he's like, I don't get that, and I and I try and tell him that there's. A mix of personal and business that's unlike what you deal with in real out there nine to five punching a clock type of business, you know. Um, and it's funny because he'll tell me, he told me one time, he goes, wasn't that your comic, your friend? He goes, you're always really nice to him. I said, I'm nice to everybody. But right. no, I don't know. I, I know him as well as you do. You know, right. Like, right, 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 yeah. right. He comes into the club. You know, I've never hung out with him outside of the club. Like it's that's we don't know each other like that. And, and so it's it just, like, why would that guy talk trash about you if you guys are friends? <laughs> I don't uh, understand. No. Don't you like each other? <laughs> no, it's get just it. Like, yeah. <laughs> they don't get it. No, it's just funny. It is funny. You know, it's just but you know, I'm gonna tell you something. He's he's also through. he's also not wrong. In the sense of one of the one of the obstacles abnormal. Of most, it's an abnormal of, life. of most comics that the thing that blocks them from real success, a lot of times it's something as simple as showing up for your spots, not being late, you know, not being late. And, and I guess in a sense, we give it credence because you almost can't not because it's so rampant and 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 we you know we but it ain't it, it's really just it, it, he's not wrong he's, he's 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 they're being disrespectful you know what i mean one of the things about the covid that taught me like you get to a certain level of of proficiency and i didn't realize this that how i was like ah, i'm not doing that show i don't i want to do that I, you know and then when you it's taken away from you and you don't have the ability to, to get on stage and and do mm -hmm. what we do. I, since I've been back, dude, I'll do a laundromat. I don't give a fuck. Like, get me on stage. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I, you know, even from my perspective, and I'm always, um, I do, I'm very mindful of keeping uh, that peg. And I am, and I have to admit, I don't know if maybe it's a downfall now, but I have to admit, there is that part of me that's very old school about you better put your fucking time in and pay your dues. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry, right. but I am. You're right. You well, know, because and, you have, and, it, with the social media and the, and the Instagram and all this, there's guys who, and, but when you get those guys, when you, when you, you know, I mean, you, I don't have to tell you, you ran around with, uh, with Ralphie. It, you don't, you cannot cut the mustard unless you put your time in. And, and there was a, you know, when I start, I mean, I started, I was 34 when I started doing comedy. So, but I was 34. Yeah. I had a job with a pension and, 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 but I knew that you had to pay your dues that you, as you shut your mouth and you respect the people There were younger dudes, guys who were age wise younger than me, but older than me in comedy. And I knew what my place was and I knew 
where I could, where, what I, you know, you, you get a sense. And, and there's such, that's so not the case anymore. Do you know what I mean? Oh, 100%. Because I, it, and I kind of watched that happen, mm. which I'm sure you did too. You watched oh, yeah. that that tide change, yeah, you know, yeah. where um, now all of a sudden uh, before somebody used to buy a ticket to a club because it was a comedy club and it didn't matter who was on the bill. Mm-hmm. Now people follow a comic, yeah. whether they're paying a gas station, an arena or a yeah. specific club, right? Because they're kind of curating their own fan base. Right. And that was never a possibility before, yeah. before, You know, I mean, I remember the days when internet sales for tickets were hardly a thing. Yeah. In 2000, when I opened the San Jose Improv, I was like, are you kidding me? I have to be there at 5 a.m. What for? Because the phones are going to start ringing. They're doing morning drive time press. Wow. Oh, okay. Uh (laughs) And then, you you know, that's a that's a big big shuffle from, you know, now some clubs don't even keep a box office. They just, they're like, don't know. Every, buy them online. Go buy them online. Yeah. They want, you can't <laughs> you even can yeah. get them at the website. Yeah. 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 I, it's funny. I tried to, uh, I, I was, uh, I, I was trying to buy food and I, you know, I couldn't find the restaurant on, on, on Grubhub. So I called them and they were like, it was almost like I could see them going, you want to order to pick up? Like what? Confused and annoyed. Who with you. who are yeah. you? Yeah. Are you ninety six? Do you not have a cell phone? Yeah. So it's you so fucked up their whole day. The system too, in a way, and in a way you have because it's just different now. They're like, what? Well, we don't even know how to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, we just yeah. wait for the they piece of paper to print had, out on the thing. They had no idea how to take the order. Like I, I had to literally go to the restaurant and order to take out. And even then, they were like, you. Why, like, why are you here? You know, it was just like, it's, it's insane. Well, you know, every club has that thing where you keep server checkbook, you know, server check, checkbooks, like right. the little tablets, right, right, desk right. checks, yeah. and a pen and a calculator and one of the credit card, old school credit card swipers <laughs> where they sign and you right. have to take all the information out. Right. Um, just in case power outage or, or everything goes down and you still need to take orders and get orders. Right, 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 right. The cooks and the servers that don't know what standard abbreviations are for shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah. I I was I was like, oh yeah. And that was or kids that aren't being taught cursive anymore. Yeah. That, that, even to that extent <laughs> within it, yeah. To now, that extent. But here I wanted to say this so you you meet this guy. He's laughing at the things, the probably the cringeworthy stuff, um, probably because he's a union guy sitting around a bunch of dudes who've been in a paper mill and they're and they're all shitheads and just talking, you know. So there's that. But I I I do find that a lot of women, um, initially have a really tough time getting a dude because. We, because because of what you're accustomed, you're accustomed to men being a. I mean, you grab that mic, you gotta. You, you, I mean, I don't have to tell you. It's you know what direction this is going in, and if you don't, you ain't letting nobody else know that you have no idea if that's on purpose. And so you find it's men so much. Regular square dudes are so. I. You know, I don't know. Could I maybe take you out? Maybe if something, if you're not doing, you know what I mean? Like that, that kind of alphaism that you get accustomed to that it becomes, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I can see it in your eyes. I do. And, you know, I have to say, I'm really, really lucky with my husband. He is, uh, he's definitely, I mean, he's, he was a union mill worker and he's, he's definitely a man. Right. He's a but dude. Yeah. He has like, he's got a very kind heart, very compa- You know what I mean? Very compassionate. Yeah. Yeah. And he's just, it's funny because he's almost old school respectful. Yeah. Yeah. So I, at first o- opens I the doors, shocked. pulls out the chairs, all the, yeah. the work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, you're not paying for that. Like just, you know, it, very much opposite of anything I would have right. normally been attracted, like normally been into. 
right right <laughs> you know and that's a uh, and it was just bizarre I think it was because we were really good friends and knew each other from mm-hmm. you know from high school that it just made it easy to uh I think I think his guard wasn't up we were just hanging out okay. at the show do you think we it would have been you think it would have been different if 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 there was intent if it, there was an intent but on well, his part um no i don't think he has he, does, he doesn't have another he's he's one no gear game. it's no gear right it's no right. it's no yeah right he's right. got no game like that right, right, he, right. he does things in a very uh subtle way where he'll be like hey i remember you said you liked this thing that time and so a box with a card will show up right right very quiet very indescript about stuff he doesn't go out of his way. He doesn't make a fuss about anything. He's very even keel. Yeah. So I think one of the, that, I think that's part of the appeal to me is that there's mm. not that aggression and I'm very outgoing and I'll make a trucker blush. Yeah. So I don't, you know, so I'm not. Yeah, that's what I, that was also what I was thinking about is that you've been, <laughs> in order to survive in the circles you are, you, you, I mean, you have to be tough. You're a, you, you get a dude 100%. glazing. You get what I call a dude glazing, you know. And what's interesting, even about that, is that that scares other men. Well, like I always talk to Candy, like Candy, Candy, when I like any relationship problems, we would talk. She would always talk to me, and I was like, you, you gotta understand, like you, you're, you're, we broke you, you know, <laughs> we broke you. And now you're like these, you know, insecure sense and not the sensitive because I'm a sensitive dude. I'll do that. Like, I remember dating a girl and she said, um, she said, oh, I didn't know they had peanut butter Oreos. Right. I go, oh, yeah, they got, I go, they, I got, I go, they, oh, they got a lot of different. Uh, she goes, you kidding me? I go, yeah, they got strawberry and this and that and the other birthday cake and Right. And she was like, you're kidding me. Right. And so like for maybe a month, I went around and I found every kind of Oreo that they made. So pumpkin variety. variety. (laughs) So to the point where she had to go, babe, stop. No, no more Oreos. Like I have to. I have to get I have stacks of Oreos, but anytime I would find another flavor or something, I would go, but I'll, you know, I'll do that just, but kind of like, Oh, you like these here. Do you know what I mean? But not like, Oh, you know, it wasn't a presentation. It was, I like you. I, I want to see you happy. This makes you happy here. You know, where she would literally be like, um, I, uh, she would go, oh, I like so and so, and she would go, but don't buy it. Like she would have to, because she knew. Careful tell what you, you not wish to buy for, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Careful yeah, what yeah. you wish for, yeah. Because I, if you mention it out loud, it'll come true. It's funny. I'm married now. And it's funny thing. My wife, I lost my headphones, right? And I got these Sennheiser, these really dope headphones, because I'm super indulgent. And I lost my headphones, and she sent me a picture of that she found them in the you know little case little wireless and she said uh I, I i have your headphones right and and i go like frantic and she goes and i go thanks oh great right and she goes uh because if i don't if i didn't tell you have them you will go and buy another pair like i will not do without you know what i mean <laughs> And I said, oh, she goes, yeah, I know you'll just go out and buy another one. And I go and I didn't tell her this, but I I, I, I had already bought another pair. Right. So now I have, <laughs> I have two. But but, you know, that it's kind of that that kind of. And, and so it's one of the things that we uh, you know, like this is a relationship podcast. And one of the things is I say real game is no game because there's an authenticity. 100 percent. If you're trying to. You know, I mean, and you know, you know, just like, with it, you know, I talk about comedy and, I, and you know, like, uh, you know, like we were talking, I was talking to somebody or we were doing a show earlier and I was saying how when you do crowd work, there are people who do contrived crowd work. It's planned. I know what I'm oh, going to say. And 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 there are people who you talk to 
and they're doing crowd work and they're listening and talking. It's happening in re real time. So and I say this to younger because I do I do a class every once in a while and I'll say, stop asking people who has cats. If you're going to do your dumb cat joke, do your fucking dumb cat joke. <laughs> you don't have to. They, you just they, you're not going to connect with them because you have a cat in it. Oh, we're cat people. Now I'm going to listen. They're going to listen to you anyway. And the fact that you're being disingenuous as if to connect with them in a way on cats that, OK, now we're both cat people, so I'm going to laugh. It's just it's so absurd. Whereas when you don't give a fuck about the I'm, I shouldn't say you don't give a fuck about them. But when you're doing what you do, they understand that you're they will follow you because you're leading them. And so mm -hmm. what you're talking about is that he has no game. It's like there's an authenticity of going you like this. That's the best game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is no game. I just, you like it's it. I no want game. you to be happy. It's the best game. Oh, yeah. It comes in the form of sincerity. You know, it just comes in the form of like being honest. Oh, and yeah. if you care, caring and doing and having no shame about it. Like, well, that's you know, it's amazing. I, I was blown away because I've always had, um, you know, like I said, I used to do Sunday supper every Sunday. Uh -huh. right. Um, I used to, uh, but you and do I that because you as care, as I can. like you care. You didn't oh, do it as a phony right. thing, a networking yeah. tool. Yeah, you do it because you're like, I want to make sure everyone's taken care of, and that people uh, feel that affection and that genuine nature, and they I appreciate that. I have to say, that. the one thing that I used to get in trouble for at the Hollywood Improv is that they'd be like, "You know, what fucking manager has a two hundred dollar comp bill for food?" <laughs> I'm like, "Oh." Well, the kids were hungry. Oh. <laughs> Everybody got a hamburger, you know. Yeah, <laughs> like, so, you know. But that was it. Was true. They'd come in, and I was and they'd like, be hungry. They really are hungry. I was like, I was like, I think these motherfuckers all live in the same studio apartment. Yeah, <laughs> like maybe they're hungry. And that was that was like one of the that was one of the things. I was like, they're looking at each other. You know those old school cartoons where they're stranded on an island. Yeah. And they see each other and they're like look, looking and like chicken. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was like, um, they're looking at each other like that cartoon right yeah. now. Yeah. Maybe I should throw another basket of fries out there and some burgers, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beat yeah. Um, but I, doing that, like cooking for them, going to the clubs and hanging out, and even after working at the club, I used to go into Hollywood and hit the clubs. And I do once or twice a week and I just make pans and pans of baked goods uh -huh. and I throw them in like the green room or at the uh -huh. bar or at the server station. Right, right. And I throw them out and I make enough to hit, you know, I do the trifecta, I hit the factory and then the <laughs> improv and then the comedy store and I would go and I would take the baskets of stuff, you know? Uh -huh. Right. And um, any other time I was dating, they, I could tell that they'd be annoyed. Like exes were always like annoyed at any of the attention that I give to the comments. Yeah, there was yeah. always like a certain level of annoyance, and I was like, well, then you know, yeah. I'm gonna pick them every time. So yeah, then that, know, com <laughs> that comes from uh, just a negative self esteem and not believing that you deserve it. So you start to wonder. You don't want any competition because you're worried that you could lose. That's why you want to eliminate any possible competition. He, he was talking about these yeah. boyfriends who are jealous yeah. of this attention. They, they, I, I don't. It, it, I call it shoplifting the pussy. It's like you, you don't. Yeah. You, you, you're trying to sneak. <laughs> That's a good term. <laughs> you, 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 you sneak in. You know you don't deserve to be here, but you're here and now. You want to everybody get back. Everybody, nobody else. You, when the, the reality is somebody who, especially a woman with that kind of dude glazing, she'll give you it all if you des if you're deserving of it. Like, yeah, yeah. But if you're not, if you're uh, because if you're saying I'm not worthy and, and this is women in general, I say this all the time. You guys don't understand the empathy of what it is that a woman has an intuitive sense that I that I believe in my in my in my heart and soul that it's genetic. You if you I I have said this a hundred times when a woman goes out with a guy, she's going. Um, I love to go to the Olive Garden with you, 
uh, for free, free breadsticks and salad. And I hope you don't kill me. Like that is a thought. <laughs> she has to be concerned of whether or not you're going to rape her or murder her. And and women over and over again largely will choose the breadsticks and the salad. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Hoping that the, so the intuitiveness of a woman understanding the disingenuine, disingenuineness of men has to be so heightened because right. it could mean your life. Now, you being around yeah. comics even more so is there's an intuitiveness that you get from being, and this is what I was saying about how, I mean, your dude got lucky because I like, I've seen so many women around who, who, you know, women who are in the business around people, we, we break them. You get, because you're like, uh, you go out on a date and you're like, you know, he wants to tell you a joke. I got, Hey, I got a joke. And you're like, dude, I've been hanging. I've been (laughs) hanging. I've been hanging. I was Ralphie May's road manager. There's nothing you're gonna say that's that's funny. And if you do, I'm surprised. But all right, go ahead. You, you know, two that's guys in a bar. Too. You know. Well, you know that was the funny thing is that his dry wit in just natural. conversation or observation or in general observation flows so naturally that I think he doesn't even realize he's being, you know, that he is funny sometimes. So often, And sometimes yeah. I'll laugh and he'll just side I mean, he'll go, oh, yeah, I guess that might have been construed as funny. Yeah. But, you know, but he's kind of serious too. Right, right, right. Hilarious. right. Which, which makes it even funnier. Makes it funnier. Yeah, the fact oh, my that aunt, he's not my even aunt and I, who are like the biggest connoisseurs of comedy. Really? The two of us. Oh, oh yeah. So you got an aunt that's all into <laughs> Oh, she's a, we must talk. We talk over Snapchat. We send each other the most ridiculous shit all day. Uh, uh. Um, she'll have, Pete Holmes became a part of our everyday language accidentally. What do you mean? Um, well, you know, in 2017, I took a year off from everything. Uh-huh. And I went back up to Northern California and I stayed with my aunt and helped her. Uh, tend to my grandfather in his final days and then get her the house together afterwards because my mm-hmm. dad had already passed and mm-hmm. there weren't other anyone else around to help her with that uh-huh. it was just not there just There's wasn't nobody else yeah no and so I went up I went up and um, I took a year off and it was just a. Uh, I know that her sense of humor she likes cleaner humor okay she just likes cleaner humor um, she can yeah. appreciate something, and and she's older, you know. It's my dad's age. Yeah, because it's a, it's now. also a, a cultural. It's an age, it's a cultural yeah. and an age thing too. Yeah. You know, she's an older Mexican lady. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, you need that dirty <laughs> crap, you know. Like, um, but uh, she appreciates a really well crafted joke, and uh, we were. She didn't want to hear any music. We had just dropped my grandfather off at hospice, and we're driving home, mm-hmm. and the drive was just too it was too quiet and neither one of us felt like talking mm-hmm. and i said i can't sit in this silence it's just uh, uncomfortable right um and and it was heavy silence too because of the circumstance and i was like oh my god i want to throw comedy on but i don't i don't want to like who should i put on yeah yeah because i was like you know nobody can slide a dick joke in there or yeah, it's yeah, gonna blow right. this car ride right 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 and so I put on Pete Holmes impregnated with wonder. Okay. And we cried laughing the whole way home. Right, right. And he has this bit where he talks about, you know, because he's his humor is very layered and to me, and for and I prefer blue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was on the road with Ralphie. Well, right. But Pete's one of my favorites because he's smart about his silliness. Right. If that and he's, makes and sense. he's very comfortable with it. And Very he's, com- oh, he's yeah. comfortable. He's goofy and come just because fun dad. I was, yeah, <laughs> I was just saying this. See, Pete, Pete, when Pete came and started doing comedy, I w- I was in the Boston. He was barking in front of the Boston, and so he's such a big goofball. People used to pick on him all the time. And I would always stop them from from bullying him. I'm like, yo, leave him the fuck alone, you know, like that. But he's so comfortable with his goofiness. But I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Oh, no, that's okay. So I I believe it's one of the first bits 
on that particular album, but he talks about freaking himself out or scaring himself mm. just within his own head. Right. And he's talking about driving for hours alone. And then all of a sudden getting this feeling and reaching behind the seat as if to, you know, just be, like you feel like something's back there. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, what happens the day I feel a face? Mm hmm. And he goes, what do you know? Then what? Why would I reach back? Like, right, 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 right. That, I'm not a guy definitely that, yeah, like, yeah. very much like his thing. But that struck such a chord with her that it was, it was just, it was one of the, we were crying laughing by the end. I mm -hmm. was laughing, not because I hadn't heard that album 90 times before. But the way it affected her. But the way it affected her, right. just really, that was just like How a, it impacted a, a her. How beautiful it impacted moment. Somebody you cared about. Yeah. Yeah. So flash forward to you know a couple months later and i'm working a little but still you know still there at the house with her and of course with anything i do it's late at night mm -hmm. and she's not used to having somebody come in late at night she's lived mm -hmm. alone with my grandfather for 10 years right right it's night night time is for sleeping night time is for <laughs> sleeping and she is like a lighter sleeper mm -hmm. um never been married never had kids so she's you know that's gonna freak you know that would freak her out a little bit right so i opened the front door real quiet as if i were sneaking in past curfew mm. <laughs> you know just not to wake her up <laughs> and um i hear her yell i'm feeling a face across the house <laughs> and i went it's just me and so it became a thing uh -huh. where from that bit yeah. and from that day um Anytime I walk in unannounced, she'll go, hi, face. Mm -hmm. I'm back right. here. Comes with this and it kind of inside joke. Thing. Yeah. 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 And, it, and it's just always amazed me what a huge part of comedy, uh, what a huge part of our lives, our everyday lives, good comedy can be. Right, right, right. That's just a well-written joke, yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and it yeah. just becomes a part of conversation. Uh Marty catches a lot. My husband catches a lot of that. Right, right. Where he'll laugh and he'll oh, be he like, gets hey, it. that's like, he gets it to the point where he's like, hey, that's like that bit. <laughs> uh, and even when I think he's not listening or doesn't find something particularly funny, mm -hmm. he gets that right away. Yeah. And it, that's always it's funny because me and, me and Harry and I have this thing we do, you know, and this happy we have this thing when we do, uh, with Pablo Francisco, we we oh, always go right. hold my baby. Hold you know when he's the like, hold my here we go. Like, <laughs> gonna, hold my baby. The girl is gonna yeah. fight this reason. girl for that. She goes, <laughs> hold my baby. Hold my baby. And we do this all the time, and we fall out because it's like hold my baby. So I get those little saying. things that bring you joy. It's yeah. those little things. That One hundred percent. Yeah. I feel like there's an absence of really good writing like that anymore that for as many comics that are out there with followings and with everything else there's a slight there's uh that they just don't do it like they used to <laughs> you know there's very few I mean, and far there's, between. Yeah, I mean but let's be honest there, there was always far and few between I mean we you, yeah. you you were very lucky to be around I think you were around the ones that were great and so your perception was like oh it was all these but it, it, it was always <laughs> but no, they were really few and far between it was few and far between there was a whole lot of shit coming i mean when you talk about you talk about like like uh jam and jim his his pool his pool was shit yeah the, the, a lot of the bridge and tunnel dudes were shit still are shit you know, um, even if you talk about, you know, I mean, and this is older than 2000, but if, even if you talk about, you know, people talk about the bastard, you know, like uh, Def Jam and how, but Def Jam was a plethora of so many different styles. Yeah. That when, uh, when, what you call it, when, uh, when uh, Stan Lathan kind of bastardized it with Comic View, yeah, it, it became a thing where, like, I I went out to Canada, and the dudes had got out in Canada. They had gotten the Def Jam tapes, and everybody was doing Def Jam stuff. I mean, they were Canadian doing the Def bitch. Jam. It was Canadian. <laughs> I don't know what I'm thinking. Yo, it was 
Women every... be shopping, eh? <laughs> eh? <laughs> Women be shopping, eh? Hey, I called my you... wife up. I said, where are you at? She said, I'm shopping, eh? <laughs> she was Man, like... Man, I have a soft spot for Canadian comics. I yeah. love them. Canadians are great. I love Canadians. I just love the idea of Canadian Def Jam. You yeah, see, but the, you see this Calgary anything. Flames game, eh? What the fuck are they doing? <laughs> Y'all play too much. Yeah, it was like, you ladies have to wash your private parts. Yeah. yeah. If yeah. you want us to eat it, you got to wash it, eh? <laughs> so, I, I ain't afraid of you motherfuckers. <laughs> so it's... it's uh. but you, but if you really think about it, there were these, there were a lot, there was always special people yeah. I think that you've just, I, I, and I, and I, and I, and I almost get a sense of just, you know, even talking to you, your love for it, and and how, how, how enlightened and how lucky you feel about being a part of it. Brought the, you know those they you became kind of the moth to the flame, you know what I mean? Because you were open to kind of seeing these people, these really creative and special people. And then and and they came to you because you just you know because you were the yeah let yeah I fuck with her you know what I mean and so they they really but it's just it's an interesting thing it's like you know we don't want to do the um you know we don't you don't want to do the you know back in the days you know like I might like my dad used no. to go my dad used to go you know yeah with this hippity hop and this <laughs> boogity boo. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. I mean, my dad was really open. Like even yeah. even hearing uh 2000 when was it? 2000 probably 2000 2000 2001. Uh-huh. Um I brought him into the improv in mm. San Jose right. to see Gabriel Iglesias. Okay. Cuz my dad's very um you know, he's very straight born and raised mexican in san jose okay you know? okay oh, all right so yeah 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 yeah. and so um raiders fan and everything uh, so it's just funny to me because he came and uh out of all he loved gabriel but he loved felipe mm -hmm. he was like he just sounds like he said he sounds like family yeah yeah <laughs> like and right. i just and i and it was just funny to me that he caught because that was, they were all very young in it then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Gabe was headlining and definitely selling out, but it was, I still feel like that was early for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, And definitely for Felipe. And yeah. I think Martine was hosting at the time. So like, yeah, it, it it's just weird that he saw it and he was like, he's going to be really, really big. Yeah. And I'm glad he got to see him win last comic standing. Right, 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 right. Like before, that yeah. was like I think, yeah, I think that was like right the year before he passed. So I was yeah. like, I was so glad he got to see that because he was like, he really he's making it. <laughs> like he was happy for that, and he and I like that he kept an open mind and that everything didn't have to be Red Fox or Lenny Bruce, right, or, right, 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 you know, right, or George right. Carlin. Like he was open minded right. to listen to all of it, and he loved it. Um, I still love watching open mics and seeing that one. The Even one if guy, I sat yeah. through fifty terrible ones, where I'm like, yeah, yeah. my <laughs> watching little pieces of my soul fly away. <laughs> but you see that one, and it brings it all back. And like that, you know, what I always funny. said, you know, what I always said that about uh, Schultz, Andrew <sighs> Schultz. I when I saw him, when I first saw yeah. him, I was like. In fact, I got um, thing. I got I I introduced him to my managers because he was, because he was a dude like at the time they were um, I don't know if you remember the Village Lantern. You remember the Village Lantern? It was like yeah. a, a little spot around on Bleecker. He 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 worked at like he did a show and he produced and barked. Three years he barked that room, and just worked in that room. And I remember seeing him early and on and I and I think what because the guys who run the stand now uh you know Kimowitz and them signed him because they had signed me and I and I introduced him. but it was like he was one of the dudes that I was like yeah that that dude you know if but you also see a guy you also see guys who have that and then they get to like a ceiling and they never punch through that you know what I mean like 
where you mostly when I see that it's fear and ego. It's it's what fear. Fear and ego. Yeah, yeah. And that's a deadly combination for somebody that really has true talent. I think it stumps it stumps them most of the time. Wow, that's amazing. Um, we gonna can we can you hang out for a little bit? We're gonna do something for the behind the wall with the Patreon, please. You got it. Thank you. I will sweetie. absolutely the hang out. You're the absolutely <laughs> best. Um, anything you want to plug? Anything? I know, so you're producing shows now, right? You're producing independently. I'm working. I'm working and producing shows. My primary gig that I'm that I'm really super excited about. I'm working with Tixer, which is a ticketing platform, and launching their comedy division. Okay, dope. Which I dope. started pri- prior to the pandemic, but um, just what a is, really cool the, platform. What's the what's the I mean, what's the format of it? What what is the format? It is such a cool platform. It just it does everything. It captures it captures data, mm-hmm. and the clubs and the producers own their own data. Okay, it's not there. It, it I think it's changing the landscape of how shows and clubs can market. Mm-hmm. Evening the play, evening evening out the playing field a little bit, and uh, just the technology is pretty flawless. And I'm kind of into that. I'm kind of a geek with technology anyway, but mm-hmm. I love the possibility of what it can do for artists, for clubs, for producers across the board. So dope. That's dope. Any yeah. uh, social media, any where they can get you, or whatever. At D Burdett for literally everything: Facebook, okay. Instagram, Twitter. Dope, dope. Harry, talk to me. Uh, you can see all my stand-up uh, on my YouTube channel at Harry Turjanian and all my social media at Harry Turjanian. And uh, check out, follow us over at the Patreon. We're talking about some cool stuff over there. Uh, Patreon.com slash Manschool202. It helps us keep this show going and uh, it helps us keep giving you this uh, advice about life and ladies and everything in between, man. Uh, Andre D. Thompson, he's uh, Andre. Uh, he's also one of the co-hosts. He's out in, uh, in L.A. doing the... Uh, new faces now funny dude um so just want to plug him real quick all of my stuff just google me dante nero i've been around you can find me uh instagram the dante nero don't forget the patreon also the, the relationship stuff one-on-one consultations dante nero.com click on consult and you can book time with me if you got a problem or whatever uh gybb get your balls back wwdd what would dante do the sexual revolution is being podcasted um i love y'all man we're out <laughs>